Mark. How are you? Fine, Heather. How are you? Very well, thank you. I'm Heather McDonald. I'm a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. I'm Mark Lyman. I teach public policy at UCLA. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Me too. And uh, Mark, I've been looking forward to this discussion. We're going to talk about various criminal justice issues. I hope we get to what I find one of the most dangerous and, and misguided ideas in, in the public discourse today that uh, the criminal justice system discriminates against blacks and that that discrimination explains the high black incarceration rate. But uh, before we get that, I'd love to hear you talk about a forthcoming book that you've got and a cover story in the American Interest. And you have some pretty radical claims in there, such as that uh, prison is actually pretty good value compared to the cost of crime and that officials should use uh, post-arrest detention as a, as a punishment of offenders. But your main charge is that uh, we could reduce crime and the prison population by about half in 10 years by applying the oft-ignored principle of swift and short punishment. So how, how exactly is this going to work? Um, well, to back up just one second. Prison's a good value for the taxpayers and the crime victims. Once you start counting the damage to the people imprisoned and the people who care about them, um, then the calculation is not so good. I think at the current margin, we could well do with less prison. Um, but the main problem with the system, as I see it now, is that it over relies on severity and under relies on swiftness and certainty. Um, a ten-year sentence is just not a very good deterrent if it happens a long time after the crime and isn't very likely to happen in the first place. Um, so, you know, the, the, the current lottery system um, is not the one that's best designed to reduce crime uh, while controlling the cost to the system. Well, how are you going to persuade uh, criminal defense lawyers to uh, speed the pro process along? I, I've heard a theory and I've, I've not been able to confirm it, that sentences creeped up uh, in tandem with the due process revolution and the uh, according of more and more rights to criminal defendants so that there was some sort of balance going on there. Uh, do you, have you seen any evidence of that? I n never heard that theory. Um, uh, I can't imagine any mechanism that would make it true. Uh, look, the, the reason uh, it takes a long time to get somebody to trial is there aren't enough courtrooms, there aren't enough judges, there aren't enough. So, so if the problem is not too much due process, it's not enough bodies. Um, when the case is ready to go to trial, that's when the plea bargain happens, and we simply have to make it possible to go to trial earlier. The federal system has a 60-day speedy trial rule, uh, and that mostly works. I, you know, these are great ideas, Mark. Uh, but you're going to have to persuade people. It seems to me that the weight of opinion these days is tending away from incarceration at all. Uh, so I think you need to make the argument that incarceration does work, uh, both to incapacitate criminals and to deter criminals. But we all already have most people are not, most criminals are not in the prison system. Uh, there's nearly twice as many people on probation right now as, as in prison, and the actual incarceration rate for criminals is very low. The uh, JFA Institute, which is hardly a, a right-wing outfit being funded by the uh, Open Society Institute, estimated that in 2007, 3% of all violent and property offenders were actually in prison. and barely uh, less than 2% of burglars, say, in 2004 were in prison. So we already have most people uh, that are involved in crime are already in the community. So how do you propose to make sure that when they're being kept out of prison, which I take it as your, your goal, uh, that they're not reoffending? Okay, so, so several levels of that. For, I can't resist saying that I'm delighted to hear that the Manhattan Institute acknowledges that the Open Society Institute does good work. Well, um, on the other hand, I, I, I will accept their figures sometimes. I don't, I don't always agree with their arguments when they right. say that uh, the idea of crime is somehow a, uh, a, a, a semi-racist construction. But, uh, 
I'm not sure whoever said that. But, well, they think but, but, they but, but, but back up, back up for a second. So, two million people, two point three million people behind bars. If that's only three percent of the offenders, right? Then there are sixty million offenders out of two hundred and forty million adults. No, right? there's, there's got to be something wrong with those numbers. But, but the basic point is right. They published it. Well, uh, I haven't seen the paper. Um, but three percent can't be the right number. Um, but your number is right, that there are about twice as many people who have been convicted and are under criminal justice supervision who are outside the walls than are inside the walls. And part of the problem is because we're spending all of our money on the institutions. We're not doing anything on the community correction side. I mean, it's sort of like the, the health care system. We spend all the money on the inpatients and have nothing left for the outpatients. Um, now, we're starting to learn how to make the community correction system work. And just adding money to it wouldn't help. Um, you could double the budget of the existing system and could not get much benefit out of it. But uh, Judge Stephen Ong in Hawaii uh, is demonstrating that if you make it the case that breaking the terms of your probation leads you to be in jail that night, that you can make probation a system that works. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do that, you don't actually have to send many people to jail. The key to fixing the crime problem is what my teacher, Tom Schelling, used to say up in the nuclear context, which is the perfect threat is the one you never have to carry out. And our current criminal justice system makes too many threats, doesn't carry them out sufficiently consistently, and therefore has to do a lot of actual punishing. If we were convincing in our threats, which would mean a, having more resources, and B, making fewer threats, um, we could do a lot better. Uh, and we have to, we just have to learn to concentrate. Again, I, you know, I, I, I know we're supposed to disagree, Mark, but, but these are great ideas, but I think, again, the uh, primary goal has to be public safety. As you know, uh, jails right now are bursting uh, at the seams, and Jail and prison remains what it already always has been, which is basically a lifetime achievement award for criminal offending. You have to work pretty hard to get yourself in prison. Uh, you know, in, in Los Angeles County, basically the rule of thumb is if you commit property crimes, it's okay. You'll, you'll still stay in the community. You have to engage in violence or be a, a, a serial recidivist to get get whacked. I was talking with a, a DA there, and uh, on his stack of, of cases was a uh, car thief who had been given probation for stealing a car in November. Something, you know, a car, a car theft is not considered a serious crime uh, in LA. It'll, you can stay out uh, indefinitely. But then a month later, uh, committed a carjacking with uh, a gun and, and uh, engaged in injury of the driver. So that that's going to send him to prison. But again, uh, we're not sending the bulk of offenders to jail or prison. So it's going to take a huge amount of resources, which I, I'm certainly not opposed to putting in. But you also, in your book, you talk about the uh, system in Hawaii to uh, have a very rapid response to people that uh, were failing their, their drug tests. But that was a, a remarkable system in that you had cooperation among the judge, the, uh, the, the probation, parole officers, and that, that's a hard thing to do. I mean, in my, in my experience, uh, judges don't want to serve in, in drug courts, per se, a lot. Uh, so your idea is great. The question is, bringing it to scale, and that's always been the challenge. And so far, we don't have a great record for alternatives to incarceration. Uh, but if, if you think you can make the case that with sufficient resources and, and to persuade people to put in those resources, uh, you know, there's no value to our current prison population per se. But I think, again, what needs to be brought out in the public discourse is that it has protected people from crime, and above all, uh, the, the main beneficiaries are 
people in the inner city that for too many decades had to live with completely intolerable levels of crime. Well, a, a, a couple of different things there. It's clearly true that putting somebody in prison prevents crime by that person while he's in prison. Except, of course, all the crimes he's committing against the other inmates, which we never bother to count. Um, not so clear how much crime it prevents if you integrate over time. Like I say, a lot of the crime that's prevented by incarceration simply postpones until that person gets out. That's a bad thing. It's better than uh, keeping them, having them at, at this, uh, you know, on the streets right then. And uh, well, but, if but, you can but postpone only... it and then have a more effective criminal justice or, or police response, it seems to me that is a benefit. Well, I mean, not if you're simply moving the, the, the crime back and down. Let me, let me give you the, the best example I know which is uh, street-level drug dealing, right? So we decided in at the end of the 80s that we were really going to get tough on retail-level drug dealing, particularly crack dealing. And we did that. And we sent an awful lot of crack dealers to prison. And then they came out. And then they had a prison record. And then they didn't have any other job opportunities, so they went back to crack dealing. And the result was that the wages of crack dealers were bid down from $30 an hour at the end of the 80s to below the minimum wage today. There's a, there's a wonderful uh, essay, I think it's in Freakonomics, called Why Do Drug Dealers Live With Their Mothers? Um, so in that case, putting a lot of drug dealers in prison did not, in fact, reduce the supply of drug dealers. It actually increased the supply of drug dealers. So we've got to be careful about the actual consequences. It increases the supply even though the uh, wages are going down? Uh, well, it, no, 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 Heather. The wages are going down because the supply increased. There is a there is an industrial reserve army of unemployable crack dealers. Um, and they have now bid their wages down, and that's part of the reason the price of crack is lower today when we have 300,000 cocaine dealers in prison well, than it was 20 years ago. Uh, you know, like the, 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 the replacement theory for drug dealing is something that is is uh, certainly possible, but I would say for violent crime, it is not the case that uh, a putting away a robber means that you're going to have somebody stepping up uh, to take his place. There's not exactly. a natural ceiling exactly on, right. on, on property or violent crimes. But, exactly but again, right. you know, the, the crack debate, I think, is uh, something that has been in the news recently uh, with a lot of crack history revisionism going on uh, to say that, well, in fact, crack was not a big deal. Uh, the public overreacted. There's often a, uh, again, an implicit if not explicit charge of racism here. And I think what is left out of the story is that Crack was a scourge in the inner city. It, it produced a, a lethal outbreak of violence. Uh, and the people that were calling initially for increasing the federal response to uh, cocaine crimes, and, and crack in particular, uh, were members of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, led by Charles Rangel. And, and they testified then and, and for decades thereafter to the effects of this drug um, and, and the open-air dealing, which you, you say should be the focus of, of police efforts. Uh, so the all idea, of, the idea that, that, the right. idea that uh, A, the war on crack was not a justified response to violence, I think is wrong, because the reason we were going after crack was because to go after violence, uh, and putting those dealers away has resulted in a radical drop in inner city violence. And I have never been to a police community meeting in the inner city where the residents are not demanding more officers, uh, more arrests, and longer sentences to keep people off the streets. They see the presence of open-air drug dealing as a constant threat in their lives. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I am not uh, apologetic about the rise in, in the war on crack in the 80s, but in fact, the rise in the prison population 
uh, in the 90s was driven overwhelmingly by uh, violent crime, and since 2000, uh, exclusively by violent crime. So the idea that our prison population today represents the war on drugs, I think, is, is inaccurate. Well, the, the change no longer represents the war on drugs. But it's true that about a quarter of our correctional capacity goes to drug dealers. And that's that's a lot. And over the period where that's happened, we've seen the prices of heroin and cocaine fall. Now, look, you're exactly right, I think, to want to focus on the violence. But our drug policies have not focused on the violence. They focused on the dealer. Um, and the notion that putting the dealers away is itself a value would be true only if they weren't replaced. I think you're exactly right to say that drug dealers, unlike armed robbers, are replaced. So we ought to try to have more armed robbers in prison and fewer drug dealers. Um, and uh, I'm, I, don't know, I, I think you're probably familiar with, with the High Point, North Carolina uh, experience that David Kennedy has described and helped organize, um, where they broke up a major long-standing crack market with five arrests. Well, Mark, in, in my experience, uh, police are, are constantly trying to focus their also uh, inadequate resources, except possibly in New York, where we have a massive police force. But generally, the police are pretty strapped. Uh, they do try and concentrate on uh, the most violent offenders. But I think it sometimes is difficult to distinguish uh, somebody that is a, a dealer who is a higher risk versus not. And again, in, in my experience, when you talk to people in the inner city, uh, they see that dealer on the corner as an implicit threat, whether or not he has recently been shooting people up. They, they worry about buyers who may have been sold bad crack coming back and, and spraying the community. And, and There's no doubt, and there's no doubt that open drug markets, flagrant drug markets, whether we're talking about street corner dealing or crack houses, are a major neighborhood menace and need to be uprooted. And it turns out there are ways of doing that. That's one proposition. A different proposition is that it's very useful to find all of those street crack dealers and lock them up for a couple of years. I think number one is true. I think number two has now clearly been demonstrated to be false. We ought to be locking up people who are themselves a threat um, and that's not every not every retail crack dealer. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but you know in, in pointing out that uh, in the in the state prison system at least about twenty percent uh, are there for drug violations above all trafficking. That uh, leaves out that about three and a half times that are in for property and violence. So uh, I think there's been a, sort of a misperception with the focus on the war on drugs and. and uh, to think that that's the main reason that people are in prison. The main reason people are in prison is uh, violence and property crimes or a long history of recidivism. And if but, but, we, Heather, Heather, you're right, but, but let's back up for one second. It's true that drugs are a relatively modest portion of our total prison population. It's also true that if you compare the United States with any country that we'd like to compare ourselves with, any civilized country, we have more people in prison for drug law violations than they have total per capita. Well, right? We're running 700 incarcerations per 100,000 population. A civilized country runs 150, and we used to run 150. Now look, I don't, I don't disagree that if the choice was between crime and prison, prison was a bargain. But now we've got to figure out a way to get a, get a better, better bargain. And making community corrections work is the better bargain, and you're right to focus on the public management part of it, right? It's it's not that we can't get the resources. It's not that the ACLU was in the way, though you know it's always fun to blame them. The problem is we can't get ourselves on track. We have met the enemy, and he, he is us. If we can get the criminal justice system to work together, um, and uh, in 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 Hawaii they're doing it at scale. They've got a, th a thousand of their eight thousand felony probationers under tight control. Well, That's a pretty spectacular result. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the, the uh, comparisons with Europe are, are difficult to make, and there is no uh, single standard for crime, crime rates. But as far as the drug 
uh, the drug part of our population, Europe never had the crack wars. So, uh, you know, this was pretty much uniquely an American experience. And again, the people that were most hurt uh, by the rise of, of crack dealing were law-abiding inner-city blacks. So I feel that the primary focus has got to be uh, on making sure that people that are doing the right thing, that are making the choice to stay out of uh, a criminal lifestyle, are given the same degree of freedom from fear and, and actual violence as, as people living in uh, wealthier neighborhoods. So we're, we're, we're completely on the same page on that. I, I keep making the speech that if the 14th Amendment requires equal protection of the laws, we have an unconstitutional criminal justice system because it does not equally protect poor people and rich people. It does not equally protect black people and white people from crime. Um, and so the, the disproportion in who's in prison, it seems to me, is less of a racial justice problem than the disproportion in whose victimization gets vindicated. Right. Well, the police uh, have, they work their hearts out, in my experience, to protect uh, innocent inner city black victims, as well as basically all black victims. Because now, thanks to the revolution in policing that began in New York City, uh, that uses crime data to manage police resources and direct uh, police activity at, at crime hotspots, as you would agree with, uh, does not distinguish between the race of victims or whether victims are themselves involved in uh, the criminal activity or not. The police commanders live or die on the numbers. and. So if they have a, a crime outbreak uh, in a black neighborhood or a white neighborhood, they are going to bring all the resources at their uh, disposal to try and, and bring that down. So this has been, I, I think, probably one of the most important revolutions in policing. And, and we also have changed the received wisdom from the 60s that uh, dominated policing for far too long, which is that the police can do nothing about crime. And that gave them a, 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 a pass to basically react uh, passively to crime and sometimes uh, to ignore crime in uh, black neighborhoods. I mean, that was, that's been, uh, unfortunately, until uh, several decades ago, the real racism problem in the uh, policing community at least, and, and perhaps also beyond that, that we didn't take crime against black serious enough. Now we are. Uh, and, well, we are and nothing... Heather, Heather, we are at the policing level. But at the next level, we've got a problem. And again, this, this isn't racism except in the most ethereal sense. But if you commit a crime in a high crime neighborhood, it's going to be tried in a high traffic court. And the plea bargains in that court are a lot cheaper than the plea bargains in the low crime suburban court. And so it's still true, even though the police are doing their best, that if you want to burglarize somebody's apartment, you better do it where there are a lot of poor people and a lot of burglaries. Mm -hmm. That's the thing we have to change. Right. Well, uh, one thing I'd like to ask you, Mark, your description in your, in your manuscript of the Hawaii uh, probation program focuses on the uh, sign of a dirty urine to send somebody back to jail for short but, but very uh, immediate jail time. That's fine because for, for prisoners that are using drugs, you've got something that is a right. objective test for whether somebody is, is violating the conditions of probation. But for other types of crime, uh, you know, we know that Prisoners, well, we don't have that dispute, but let's just assume that um, property and violent offenders are committing about 16 crimes a year that go undetected. Uh, how do you propose to make sure that those crimes are immediately uh, noticed and, and result in uh, the swift and sure punishment that, that does both incapacitate and deter people? 
Well, I might step step back before that. Um, once we've got a system down, where every time we detect a violation of probation conditions, whether it's a dirty drug test or something else, there's an immediate sanction. Then the next step is to figure out how to detect more violations, how to monitor more behavior. And I think the most promising technology is position monitoring using cell phones or GPS or some combination of the two. After all, your cell phone company knows where you are within 30 feet all the time. Otherwise, it can't get a message to your phone. Uh, so you can imagine a system, and, and it's, already, it's already commercially available, right? Uh, Disney will sell you a cell phone for your kid's backpack so that if he gets lost, you can call him up and say, okay, where's the kid? Um, and there's a different version of it, which is <clears throat> you, using a map, set a calendar. Here's where he's supposed to be at this time of day, at this, on this day of the week. And any time the phone isn't where the kid's supposed to be, you get an email message. Well, now imagine you're a probation officer and you have that technology available, suddenly community corrections is real corrections. Suddenly you can not only know where somebody is 24 hours a day, but tell him where he has to be. Well, I don't see any reason why the first three months on probation should involve a 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. curfew. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm imagining I'm a, a lawyer with the ACLU. Um, are they going to allow this uh, as a widespread practice, or are they going to say we're becoming a, a surveillance society, uh, that this is an un, undue uh, deprivation of, of uh, liberty and freedom if you have every probationer under 24-hour uh, GPS monitoring? Well, and I'm not sure you need every probationer under 24-hour GPS monitoring. And, for example, you might want to say that there's monitoring early, and if you comply with all the conditions, then one of the things you get as a reward is you go off monitoring, or at least the restrictions are less. Um, somehow I doubt that the ACLU is the major barrier here. Well, I mean, look, look, the, 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 the right wing won that argument, right? We don't have a problem now about having enough authority. We have a problem about using it intelligently. Well, the and ACLU is able to object to <clears throat> cameras in, in the public street as a violation of privacy. Uh, I, I don't put it past them to say that putting an ankle bracelet on probationers uh, as, a, as a general policy is uh, akin to, I don't know, uh, slavery, say. So, it, again, I, you know, I think these are good ideas, but uh, in, in practice, they may run up against a lot of opposition. In practice, what they're going to run up against is the discombobulation of the criminal justice system, the, the failure to get coordination among its elements, and resource limitations. Right? I mean, the, the real problem is that an effective criminal justice system wouldn't cost the $200 billion a year we're now spending. It would probably cost $300 billion a year. And Grover Norquist will make sure that we don't have that money. Oh, well, I, you know, as you point out, uh, the, the money that we're spending on uh, criminal justice is, is trivial compared to what we're spending on things like public schools without getting necessarily the same return on the dollar. So uh, right, if, you, I, if you can show that this is something that would... Uh, actually protect public safety, which again is the crucial issue, uh, I think, uh, you know, people would be willing to spend that. Uh, but, but again, what worries me is the uh, widespread assumption in the media uh, and, and certain areas of academia that what we have now is an unjust system. And particularly when it comes to race. I mean, Obama, Barack Obama has, is going around claiming that uh, blacks and whites are arrested, uh, prosecuted, and sentenced at different rates for the same crime. Uh, I think that is a very uh, dangerous idea to put out there because it increases alienation uh, among precisely those young black males that need to be integrated into regular society, and there's just no evidence for it. Uh, well, study no after evidence. study has shown that what drives the, the incarceration rates and the arresting rates is crime, and the offending rates among blacks is, uh, are, are magnitudes higher than that for whites. You have 
uh, 52% of all homicides between 1976 and 2004 uh, have been committed by blacks. In New York City, 13, any, any given violent crime is 13 times more likely to have been committed by a black than a white. And the people, as, as you say, Mark, that are most hurt by this are the majority of, of inner city blacks who are not involved in the criminal life and who find their neighborhoods uh, under the threat of crime. Businesses are not willing to live there, to, to uh, locate there. Uh, and and it's a pall on on ordinary development. So again, uh, let's work on the problem. But I, I wish that it could be done without the knee jerk reaction that uh, what we have here is a race problem as opposed to a crime problem. Well, there's a we have both. Right? We have a crime problem that's heavily concentrated by race, and that's something we need to work on. Right. Um, but it's not helped. It's not helped by sending the message that uh, the reason we have greatly disparate uh, incarceration rates is because somehow uh, either the police are racist or judges or juries in the Bronx and Brooklyn are racist. In fact, uh, if you troll for criminal record, uh, the, the sentences are follow uh, crime crime behavior and are not affected by race. Right. I don't think there's any doubt that there are individual instances of injustice that have a racial basis. Um, I, I have a sense that if that guy who shot the people who were throwing bricks, bricks at his home had been white and the assailants black rather than the other way around, he might not have been convicted. Um, so individual examples of racism aren't hard to find. Your point is the correct point, that the system problem uh, is much more a problem on the crime commission end than on the punishment end. On the other hand, given that we have both a crime problem and an incarceration problem that bear on he unusually heavily on the black community, we ought to be working hard to minimize both. What I'm trying to get, get away from is the notion that punishment is a benefit. No, punishment's a cost. The benefit is crime control. And we ought to be working just as hard to minimize the cost of the suffering we inflict with punishment as we do to work to minimize the suffering that's inflicted by criminals on your victims. Well, I, They're both major social problems. I agree, and I think uh, things like prison rape, it's just inexcusable to tolerate that. And uh, whatever it takes to stop, stop uh, the preying upon prisoners and the, and the gang violence prisons has to be done. Uh, well, and one thing that will reduce that is reducing the population. Right? In California, mm -hmm. we're running two prisoners per per allocated cell. Right. Well, you know, again, I, I could not disagree with uh, reducing the prison population if you can do something that has not been achieved before which is to find a community probation system that actually uh, has the same effects on, on lowering crime. But, uh, there's, but there's, one other, there's one other thing to point out, right? If, if you look at the old shaken and shaken work, variety of criminal behavior, right? Looked at people in prison, right? The average prisoner was committing a hell of a lot of crimes, but the median prisoner wasn't convicted, committing that, right? It was the top 10% of the prisoners, not of the criminals, top 10% of the people in prison were accounting for half of the total crime committed by all the prisoners. So we could get a lot more efficient in allocating our prison cells to people who actually commit crimes. Well, that may be because the top 10% top are committing a heck of a lot of crimes, but as I understand it, uh, you do have ranges of estimates between say zero at the low end and several hundred a year. I, you know, best one I've seen is about 15 to 16 as a median a year. That, that's pretty high. Uh, no, no, look, look back at your numbers. I think what you're going to find is that 15 or 16 is the mean. The median is more like five, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, a large chunk of people in prison that don't really need to be there, particularly if we had a decent well, you know, community correction system, but it's, it's the McNamara problem. The, no, right? the, Somebody once, once, once said to McNamara, after he got, got to be Secretary of Defense, 
isn't it true that half of the Defense Department budget is wasted? And he said, yeah, but I can't figure out which half. <laughs> right? So we, we've got to get we got to get smarter at figuring out who's the bad actor. And one way to do that is to let people out and watch them like a hawk. Let people let people tell you whether they're real bad actors or not by complying or not complying with reasonable community corrections conditions. Well, you know, this given, what my friend Andy given calls behavioral triage. Given the uh, crowded, as you put it, in in the jail system, in the prison system, in the courts, uh, I think we probably are uh, engaged in that sort of. You have to work very hard to end up in prison. Uh, you have serial offenders that, that are finally getting locked away. But if you look at, say, jail population, very high levels of, of felony backgrounds. Uh, so it's not as if we're locking away increasingly poor sad sacks that just happen to get caught. Uh, so, well, you know, it's very... The chicken, the chicken and chicken follow-up study identified a population they called low-rate losers. People with relatively low criminal criminal crime rates who got caught every time. Uh -huh, well. um, so look, look, we're clearly making both false positive and false negative errors. There are people not being sent to prison who desperately need to be there. People being sent to prison who don't really need, need to be there. And people being sent to prison for a long time for whom that does move. I mean, the California three strikes thing is really a bad joke. And there's no way to get rid of it, apparently. Right? But we, we're, we're turning our, Phil Hyman says, we're turning our prison systems into retirement homes for former burglars. Well, right, and, and prisoner menopause is one of the ways that, uh, you know, the prison system works. But, but that would suggest that people age out of crime and so long sentences have a certain logic to them. Uh, well, but, no, the, but the it, point that I, I would really, again, want to stress is, Let's, let's uh, see if we can do this differently, but the current system as it is set up uh, is not inherently unjust because, again, it is, it is given protection to the people who deserve it most, which are those living in poor communities that are trying to do the right thing by their kids uh, and, and who should not have to live with the fear of crime. I've also seen arguments that uh, taking people and putting them in prison has a sort of an iatrogenic effect on on communities. That you are taking role models out of the out of the community that would otherwise be uh, helping to raise kids properly. And, and that this argument I find not particularly empirically grounded. Uh, it's hard for me to understand how. Being a, a a criminal who's committed enough crimes to actually end up in the state slammer uh, makes you a particularly valid role model for young kids. So again, let let's see if we can make it more efficient, faster. But the system as it currently stands is better than what up to now the alternatives have been. And we lived through that period in the in the sixties and seventies where. Uh, consistent with the theory that the real driver of crime was unjust conditions in society, we were losing uh, prison capacity, even as the crime rate was spiraling up. And I would say there's probably a, quite a, a relationship between those. And it was only and at the end of the then, 70s where we started increasing capacity and lengthening sentences. And back then, I was one of the people pounding on the table, saying we need more prison cells. Um, that was when we had half a million people behind bars. Now that we have 2.3 million people behind bars, um, I sort of feel like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Does this damn thing have an off switch? Well, I mean, we're still adding prison capacity, even though we have half the crime we had 10 years ago. Yeah, but but again, that doesn't seem to me like a sound investment. Compared to what? Uh, and and given the amount of crime that is still being committed, and the fact that, as I say, according to the JFA Institute, three percent. Of, of violent property offenders are in prison. Um, but again, it, it's, it's not that, as if they're number, locking away, and there, there's that, no that evidence of any change right. in the prison population. Well, then, then you know, go there ahead. Can't be, there what can't about, be 16 million offenders out there. Uh, well, 
uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, who I think does pretty solid work, has estimated that there's 1.6% of all burglars are in jail. So most people are on the streets. Uh, again, I, I don't want to defend the numbers necessarily, but, but the point that, I, again, I, I, I just think has to be made is um, it is not a racially unjust system. And, and it has been an, an attempt to try and provide public safety across the board in the communities that, that need it most. I mean, yesterday... But now, that, but now that we know, as you point out, that you can reduce crime by adding police, right? It was a surprise to a lot of us. Right? I mean, back in the 70s, I was saying, what do we need more police for? They're already arresting more people than the courts can convict. And the courts are already convicting more people than the prisons can hold. So all we need is more prisons. Well, Bill Clinton was right and I was wrong. Um, and as you say, Bill Bratton managed to demonstrate um, that if you use police intelligently, you can reduce crime quite a lot without sending more people to prison. The, the, the headline here is that New York, which is everybody's poster child for success, has actually been shrinking its prison population for the last 10 years. Like, it's not necessary to do what California is doing. And in fact, what California is doing isn't working. And my plea is not for you know, some racial justice theory here. It's for backing away from the rather sadistic notion that the more people we punish and the more severely we punish them, the better a job we're doing. New York has to be preferred to California. It's doing the job with policing instead of incarceration. Well, hooray. Mm -hmm. That was a good idea. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to hear conservatives in particular who say they believe in economy and government figure out that a 20-year prison sentence is an $800,000 public expenditure. It better be justified by something. But, Mark, very few people are getting 20-year prison sentences, and those that are uh, are getting it primarily for for violent offending and probably recidivism. Not so, in the federal so system. Again, not in the what? Not in the federal well, system. Well, the federal system is only 12% of, yeah. of the prison population, so we could get rid of the, of the federal system completely, and you're still going to have hundreds of thousands of people in jail. So I, th I think that's, you know, not necessarily well, um, is relevant the, to, to what we're talking about generally, which in the state system, you, but I'm asking you, you why are those penalized year, only after a lot of criminal activity. But I'm asking you why those 16-year drug sentences aren't something that outrages conservatives as a waste of public money. And the answer is because somebody's getting hurt. Because in the federal system, a 16-year drug sentence is because you have been shown to be uh, a major trafficker. And, and the federal system has, a safety, valve, has a safety valve not. provision for people that are uh, low-level offenders that have not engaged in violence uh, and uh, cooperate just by telling the truth about their own crimes, not by ratting anybody else out, uh, with the government. And at least when it comes to crack, uh, very few people qualify for that because they are uh, engaged in higher level work. They've, they've got a much higher rate of, of engagement in violence. The, again, the crack wars were, as, as we agree, a war on violence. Uh, it's, it's not yes, simply but, because but, we're, we're trying to stop the violence. flow of drugs. That's not what the crack, crack enforcement yes. was all about. Yes, because but that crack violence is largely has largely gone away, mm -hmm. right? And, and look, I say, it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yes, we wanted to do that job. We've done the job. Now we can stop doing it. Well, New York City has had a, a massive crime drop, and New York City has been the overwhelming uh, contributor uh, to the prison population in the state. So when, when the crime rate drops here, uh, you are going to see an effect on the prison population. California yeah, is massive, and, and, and Bill Bratton hasn't been that long in Los Angeles to bring the crime rate down. But the, crime the, the prison population is, is filled with people from across the state, uh, and, and I don't think you've had the same crime drops as, yeah. as you've had in New York City right. in, in places like the Imperial Valley or, or the Inland Empire. We've had, we've had very major, look, a, a third of the state California prison population is from Los Angeles. Um, so, 
and we've had a very big crime up here. In fact, this is this was one of the points that Jim Wilson made. since Brad came in 2002. No, 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 no. What's so so you know back when people like me were saying, hey, look, Bratton's reinvented policing, and, and we have a new day coming. Uh, Jim Wilson was always prepared to be the skeptic. Said, well, but look at crime in Los Angeles. It's also dropping. Um, I mean, there was a massive crime drop in the 90s for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me. Right. Um, but it did extend to California. But we didn't take any of that dividend in reducing incarceration. Well, and that was a mistake. Yeah. Well, you know, again, I, 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 I don't disagree. But the crime drop in, in uh, California overall has not been com comparable to the 70% drop we've seen in New York City that no, began back in the 90s. So the L.A. drop under Bratton has been much more recent. So, if, again, I, you know, I... What I'm saying is it doesn't look from, from the history as if incarceration at the current level is the key to crime control. We can have a lot less crime and fewer people in prison. And all I'm, all I'm hoping for from my conservative friends um, is an acknowledgement that if we can do that, that would be a good thing. Sure. It would be a good thing. There's no inherent value of having somebody in prison. Right. The only inherent value that so far has been unmatched by community treatment is, is the crime drop that you have gotten. And... and um, the, the greatest not, impact that we've had from the incarceration increase that has been dramatic, I certainly agree with that, came at the end of that buildup because that's when you had the maximum, uh, as, as Frank Simmons calls it, throw weight. Uh, he estimates that there's been five times greater effect uh, on lowering crime at the end of the prison buildup because we had so many people off the streets. and. I think the incapacitation effect of just getting people off so they can't offend uh, is probably the most powerful uh, effect that we've got because, as you point out in, in your work, Mark, uh, deterrence is, unless it comes very quickly, uh, is not so powerful with uh, your average criminal who does not have a very long-term horizon. Exactly. Uh, so, but, but, but so the, 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 the threat of punishment is not going to counter the fact of wanting that quick uh, hit of money now. Right. Uh, no, that's that's right. Though, though you, you talk about the end of the prison buildup. When will that be? Well, we're we're still adding cells. Yeah. Well, crime is still a problem, and in fact, we've seen crime is, is going up again uh, in some places erat erratically. I mean, it, it's very hard to understand as a national. Uh, matters right. you looks, say. Looks like we get a drop about 2004 in crime. And it's still going down in places that are using uh, the intelligence driven policing that we saw in New York and, and Los Angeles now. Right. So policing, I think, is the start could, of the Could problem. you guys lend us about 10,000 cops for a couple of years? <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate well, it. Well, you know, this is one area where I get uh, conservatives do have to admit that uh, big government works and. Uh, David Dinkins was absolutely right to start uh, uh, building up the police force before Giuliani and, and Bratton came in, and and we can't. And of course, you had to get police before officers Bradley. are problems. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an extraordinary thing. But but you know, it works elsewhere as well. East Orange, New Jersey, has had in three years a seventy six percent crime drop. I've seen nothing like it with a much less. Uh, uh, beefed up police force because who's, they, the, who's the chief there and why hasn't Chicago hired him? Well, he's been hired by New Jersey State to, to deal right. with uh, uh, crime and gang, gang crime in the state overall. Jose Cordero came out of the uh, NYPD and the work he has done there is simply astounding both by the uh, obsession with, with crime data and, and directing police activity to where the crime spots are highest. But also, they've got some interesting technology that they're using. They have a, uh, a crime dashboard for every police car in the city that gives 30-second updates on crime. Supervisors 
know what every single police car is doing in the city at any given time. I mean, this is this would also be an ACLU nightmare, it seems to me, for police officers, uh, that every supervisor knows whether his officer in that patrol car is out doing proactive policing to try and investigate uh, burglaries, doing vertical patrols in in uh, housing projects, is getting out of his car to try and get on the street, get police presence, and, and do uh, investigations. And they have gunshot detection technology. They have uh, residents in what were the two most crime-plagued uh, neighborhoods in the city that have been given uh, cameras and computers that they can tell the police department if there's people hanging out on the street that are suspicious. So it's a, it's a remarkable blend of, of technology and good management. But as they will say, the technology is nice, but what really matters is, is the rigorous uh, monitoring of crime patterns and using officers to try and figure out the trends and react uh, proactively to stop them. So bodies help, but it can also be done, as Brad is showing, with the uh, uh, outrageously starved police force you've got there. It, it can also be done by uh, just very, very rigorous management and holding uh, police commanders accountable for lowering crime. All, right. uh, all that's right and very encouraging, and I wish some of our other public services uh, were as progressively managed as policing now is. In particular, I wish the rest of the criminal justice system uh, were half as well managed. Well, the that is, we, should, we shouldn't end this without mentioning that there are things you can do about crime other than arresting people and locking them up. Right? I, mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the reduction in the lead content of gasoline has been a major contributor to the crime collapse in the 1990s. Uh, we know that lead poisoning is very, very bad for you, in particular in reducing impulse control, and we made a major revolution there. Um, looks pretty clear that nurse home visitation uh, makes a big difference in parenting patterns, and that makes a big difference in crime rates. There's stuff you can do about classroom discipline. Um, so, look, uh, you and I are on the same page that crime control deserves priority over almost everything else. But it's not the case that crime control and the criminal justice system are coextensive. Now, you're right. Lots of things that get sold as crime control, well, social programs that get sold as crime control, aren't proven. Um, but there are things to do, and we ought to be just as eager to do them as we are to add police officers and add prison cells. No, sure. I mean, I, I, the lead, lead issue uh, is something I'd have to look uh, more closely at. Um, but classroom discipline, surely, of, of creating a environment where kids understand that there's consequences for uh, violent behavior, for disruptive behavior. No, no, it actually turns out, it turns out much something much simpler. Swift and sure punishment doesn't apply in the classroom. I would I would say it does, and it's something well, that we have lost thanks to again the due process revolution in in classroom. Yes, 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 okay, and okay. Well, we're agreed, fear, they're we're agreed the issue is a bad thing, but but it turns out that the classroom discipline key is not swift and certain punishment. Um, uh, it's, it's all in the Harry Potter books, but uh, Shep Kellens and Meg Ensminger at, at Hopkins invented this 20 years ago. It's called the Classroom Discipline Game. The good be sorry, it's called the Good Behavior Game. Um, take a bunch of first graders, classroom full of first graders, divide them into the red team and the blue team, and say, okay, for the next 30 minutes, the two teams are going to compete in how well they can behave, and the winning team, you know, everybody gets an apple and you slowly extend the period of the contest until it includes the whole school day. That's fine, but the kids that are disrupting, again, they should know that um, yeah, they, yeah. they face consequences and they're not going to get okay. a bunch so, of law professors suing the school by saying that there's right, well, a disrupting the law professors out of this for a moment. Okay, well, it's hard to because they uh, have a disproportionate effect, I think, given their uh, but, but knowledge Heather, bases I, on, I just told on criminal you. justice system. That there's something you can do that doesn't involve the law professors. It has dramatic effects not only in classroom discipline, but on the criminal involvement of those kids. If you do a random assignment experiment, as as Kellams and Ensminger have done, randomly assign teachers to be taught this game or not, and then look at their first grade students when they're seventh grade students. The ones whose teacher had the was taught the game 
or about 30% less likely to have been arrested. Now, that's a spectacular result. Mm -hmm. It's as spectacular as anything we've done on the policing side. And yet, it's hard to get any enthusiasm about it because crime control is not the school's business and the criminal justice system is not interested in improving the behavior of first grade teachers. And so we've got a silo effect where we're not looking at all of our opportunities to reduce crime, in particular the ones that don't involve hurting people. Well, you know, small experiments uh, don't always work out well when, uh, yes, yes, when, when, when brought to scale. And yes, uh, the, 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 the idea that happen. there should be a, a single panacea like that, maybe it will work if everybody's doing the, uh, the good, good behavior competition in classes. And, and if, if that's the solution, I don't know. Uh, if it works, that's fine. But I would say that there's also some uh, broader issues that if we really want to have a large effect, and I don't know exactly who the we is, but certainly for me, uh, the most important thing which I would like to change is the marriage rate in the inner city of Laval when you have 70% of, of black kids being born to single mothers, I think that's probably uh, a driver of, of crime and, and other social problems that dwarfs everything else. Uh, so, you know, well, I, sure. if I could change anything, I would have some kind of debate over the fact that not only do uh, kids need fathers above all boys, but when you have a community where the marriage norm has all but disappeared, that means that boys are not raised with the understanding that uh, they will need to persuade a woman that they are uh, good good mates for life uh, in order to uh, impregnate people. And that it's, it's a disastrous consequence, and it's hurting uh, and stunting so many kids from having their full shot at life. So I'm, I'm happy to do, uh, you know, figure out classroom management to have a, a more positive effect on, on children's self-control. But but I think there's bigger issues as well as, as far as uh, family structure that if we don't solve those, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's much hope in the long term for radical changes in a lot of social problems. Well, as you say, we've had a 70% crime drop in New York City. As far as I can tell, the marriage rate hasn't changed. So, yes, it would be nice to solve that problem. But we still have a very, very disparate crime rate. Uh, right. You know, it's still, as I say, 13 times higher violent crime rate for blacks than whites. Well, we just had eight people uh, shot last night in Harlem up north of 125th Street. Violent crime, as you know, in L.A., uh, blacks have a ten times higher rate of getting killed by homicide than whites. So it's been it's down, but it is still unacceptably high. Uh, so, you know, we, we we can do what we as a as a public body can do uh, to change systems, but I but I think that uh, family structure without without changing that unless. We are going to uh, continue with the criminal justice system, whether it's through incarceration or, or probation treatment. That has its limits, uh, and and bringing the, the two parent family back together, I think, it probably has the most well, promise in the long run. Well, if you can convince your social conservative friends to stop worrying about gay marriage and worry about marriage, I would I would be in favor. Oh, we're all, believe me, everybody's in favor of uh, marriage, right. and and the gay marriage thing. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how well that's going to play in the black community, uh, but uh, I think that's not really relevant uh, to the marriage yeah. question at this point for, for crime issues, at least. Right. All right. We've, prob we've probably exhausted our, our audience's patience. Um, well, it's, this has been, it's fun. been a good talk, Mark, and uh, Many thanks. a lot of agreement and efforts at disagreement, but I'm not sure if we really pulled those off, but good talking to you. All right. Many thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.